Welcome everyone to the uh, weekly solutions seminar series sponsored by the Institute for Sustainable Solutions here at Portland State University. I'm Shpresa Halimi, I'm a research assistant professor with the Institute and I've been managing the seminar series. We have one more lecture to go for this term next week, next Wednesday, and then we will resume in January. Our first lecture will be on January 11th and we'll have uh, 10 speakers for the winter term as well. The theme for winter term is going to be on ecosystem services for those of you who are interested. We do have an um, online audience, so I would also like to welcome them and encourage them to continue uh, watching the lectures online. They have been great and they have been asking great questions. So um, for those of you who are um, who have been coming to our seminar series, you know that uh, we do have a Q&A session right after the lecture, and then uh, we also provide some refreshments. So uh, we encourage you to please stay and continue your uh, dialogue with uh, the presenter after the formal lecture. And uh, those who are taking this uh, class for credits, come and see me after the lecture so that we can talk about the final paper. Tonight's speaker is um, Professor Harold Fletcher from the um, Arts Department here at Portland State University. He is an Associate Professor of Art and the Co-Director of PSU's Art and Social Practice Program. He also is a fellow with the Institute for Sustainable Solutions. He received his um, Bachelor in Fine Arts from the San Francisco Art Institute and his MFA from California College of Arts. He studied organic farming at UCSC and went on to work on a variety of a small community supported agricultural farms, which impacted his work as an artist. Fletcher has produced a variety of socially engaged, collaborative, and interdisciplinary projects since the early 90s. His work has been shown across the world at such locations such as the Museum of Modern Art and the Young Museum, the Royal College of Art in London, the Whitney Museum, and the French Regional Art Collection in, Britain, in Brittany. He is the two of, uh, 2005 recipient of the Alpert Award in Visual Art. Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Fletcher. Hi, thanks. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is talk both a little bit about that uh, the microphone will be worked out. How's that? Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'm going, some of, you, some of you know a lot about social practice already, so it'll be redundant, but I'm going to kind of give an, an overview and, and give those of you who are less familiar with it uh, an idea of what social practice is. So traditionally when we think about an artist, we think of that person working in a studio space. Here's an example of that. I think, I mean, th this is at least my, my assumption of what most people in the general public assume. Somehow it just turned a little hotter. Um, so that they go in, they spend many hours in there, and they make these, these objects like paintings or sculptures that can then be potentially transported if they get permission through a gallerist or a, a museum into a uh, exhibition kind of space where the public can then look at that work. So sort of the, um, the epitome of that would be a museum setting <coughs> like this one. And the, the interaction that would be happening with uh, the public would be not directly with that artist, but with just through the sort of intermediary of the objects that they've made in their studio space that then gets transferred into this, this, um, this other white cube museum kind of space. 
with with social practice, things work differently. That there's there's not an emphasis placed on on working in a studio, making objects, or necessarily showing in um, art spaces. But if that does happen, here's an example of how it might look. This is just one of many. This is a project by Ariana Jacobs at uh, the Portland Art Museum as part of Shine a Light, an event that the Art and Social Practice program does each year with the, um, the Portland Art Museum. In this case, Ariana, who's here, invited various local musicians to make songs for works of art in the museum and then to perform them there. And so you're having a much more direct kind of an experience with the, the producer of the work. They're, you're no longer separated by, by the studio separation part and the, and the work only being shown in the gallery without that person there anymore. But social practice could look like a lot of other things as well. So this is a shot at the um, <clears throat> People's Co-op Farmer's Market. And, but what's going on is a tour of the farmer's market that a group of my undergraduate students a couple of years ago put together where they interviewed all of the farmers and the people who, who um, sold things at the farmer's market and then led, a, led various groups around the farmer's market explaining sort of the backstory on those places. So this is just a shot from one of those tours. And then here's, here's a sort of classic um, shot of a project which at the time wasn't called social practice because their um, social practice as a term didn't exist. It's, the term has only been being used in, in uh, reference to art for about seven years, seven or eight years now. And our program's been going on for about five years. So anyway, so this, this is a project though by Mel Chin. And this, the, I use this one because of its sort of connection to, to uh, kind of traditional concepts of what sustainability might be. But this is a project that's called Revival Field in which he set cordoned off an area in an, in a, on a piece of land that, had, um, that was toxic and had various um, heavy metals in them, and then grew plants that, were, um, that are supposed, supposedly can draw out those heavy metals from, from the, uh, the land. And in, in a way, sort of, if you, if you use them on a large enough scale, could sort of reclaim the land and make it um, a functional place again. So here's a, here's a little quick overview of, of what social practice might be. And as it says here, oftentimes it, it doesn't look like what you, you expect art to be and instead can wind up looking more like some of these, uh, these other kinds of um, disciplines. But at the same time, it retains some aspects of art making a variety of them, uh, and, and I'll, I'll probably talk more about that as we move along. So I'm just going to give a, a few examples of other historical precedents for what we're now calling social practice. And these ones, once again, weren't called social practice at the time that they were happening. Um, but we're able to look back now and sort of find our, our own history and the, the um, artists, activities, uh, and, and non-artists who we feel like inform what social practice can be now. So Mer Meryl uh, Letterman Eucalese was an artist in New York City, she still is, and she started doing work that she called maintenance art, where she would clean uh, public spaces. So this is her cleaning the stairs of, what, what building is this, Jen, you probably know. Is this the Whitney Museum? So it's a, like a public space. Yeah, that does kind of look like the Whitney. Um, and, and there was no other result of this other than the, the stairs be cl became cleaner. Um, but it, and, and, you know, if, if what we're thinking is that an artist needs to do some kind of work and then that becomes shown to an audience, this is, this is an example of that. The work that she's doing, though, is just cleaning the steps and then those become available to the public. But based on that, her interest in ma maintenance art, she then started connecting with the New York uh, Sanitation Department and she decided to do a project <coughs> called Touch Sanitation where she went around and shook hands with every um, maintenance worker for the sanitation department, all the people who picked up the garbage throughout the, the five boroughs. And it took several years to do this. And then she thanked e each of those people for helping to, to make the city of New York function. And as a result of doing that, she was asked by the sanitation department to become the artist in residence at the sanitation department. So they gave her a space to use and that title. She wasn't paid, but um, 
she would had had resources and access to things within the sanitation department that ordinary people wouldn't normally have. And this is a pretty fundamental uh, way of, of, of working that we now, is now is kind of established within social practice, is the idea of functioning sort of as an artist in residence in a non-art setting or with a, a um, uh, some kind of organization that doesn't ordinarily have art um, as, as part of its activity. So she, she became the artist in residence and then was able to do a whole series of different projects related to that. So this, this is one of them where she got a garbage truck and then had the exterior coated in mirrors or have, had mirrors put on it. And then it was used, I think, both for normal, normal functioning, picking up of garbage, but also for events like this was a parade. And then as the garbage truck drives by, the public sees themselves reflected in the mirror and has to sort of consider themselves in relationship to this, this garbage truck that you normally disregard and try to not pay attention to. And she's gone on to do all sorts of projects, uh, m many, many public um, projects that are based on her knowledge and expertise within the sanitation system. And it has really sort of made her career based on that. Another um, artist who comes from a theater background is John Malpied, and he started a program in Los Angeles about 25 years ago called the Los Angeles Poverty Department, or the LAPD. And he worked with um, people that he met on Skid Row in Los Angeles and created uh, theatrical projects that were sometimes done in public, sometimes done in theater spaces, sometimes done in, in other kinds of uh, locations. And the, it wasn't just doing like Shakespeare or some classical theater. Instead, he would work with the, those, those people, the members of the LAPD, to, to come up with the content of what the, the um, theatrical piece would be, and oftentimes looking at political um, developments and histories that had affected them the, uh, personally, and then creating theatrical works from that. This is a, a current sh shot of them, so they're still going 25 years later and continue to do all sorts of different projects. Their latest uh, project had to do with um, looking at incarceration and doing a project related to that. Group Material is an, an artist collective from uh, New York City that is also a really important um, historical group in relationship to social practice. This was a, a project that they did called People's Choice where they got a, a, um, a retail kind of space on the east side in Manhattan and then went around that whole neighborhood just asking for people to give them an object of significance or something that they thought of as art from their own house or business. And then they installed all of that work into their, their gallery that they created in this retail space and had this exhibition in which people in the neighborhood themselves would feel invested because it was their own objects that were in there, the things that they already valued and that they could then share and show to other people. So that's a pretty primary um, methodology too, sort of being inclusive of the people who are directly around you, the people who would ordinarily be thought of just as audience, finding ways that those people can function as participants within, within a project. This is another project they did uh, that's a, like a democracy wall in which they just took quotes from various people that they met on the streets and other places and then printed them up on these, these big posters. And then they also are, are quite well known for making um, timelines, uh, in particular one on the history of AIDS in this country. And those would be displayed in more traditional um, art spaces, but, but part of their, their um, tweak on that was that one, they were working as a collective, sometimes a huge collective with dozens of people in it, and that they would be working specifically on a, a social issue that was affecting people right then and, and there, as opposed to doing work that's much more sort of abstracted or <coughs> Um, less socially relevant. Then this is a, another artist, Mark Dion, who's done a whole number of projects that relate to um, natural history and ecology in various ways. This is one particular project that I think is really interesting. And what, what he did with it was that he worked with a, <clears throat> a set of high schoolers in Chicago and taught them about the, uh, the South American rainforest ecology in a classroom and then actually took them there. They all flew down and spent a period of time in the rainforest learning in a, in a direct manner. And then they went back to Chicago and opened a little storefront kind of space in which they could um, educate the public about what they had learned about uh, in, in regards to rainforest ecology. So education is another part that I think plays a, a, 
a big role within social practice. Here's another artist that's currently working in San Francisco, Amy Franceschini, and she's done a whole variety of different projects. This is a, a little um, herb garden that she created at the Headlands Center for the Arts in the, in the Headlands um, uh, State Park that's in Marin. And then she used a, a museum bookstore to create a classroom in which local people could come and teach various um, topics that they, they were familiar with and had skills in. And she did a project where she created victory gardens, used the idea of World War II victory gardens, and, ha and, and initiated those all over San Francisco uh, with funding from the city of San Francisco, and included, including making a garden that happened right in front of City Hall to sort of reconnect people to the idea of growing their own food and how that, could ha how that can have an impact on, on a variety of things. Then we also oftentimes are looking outside of art specifically. This one's closely connected through architecture, but it, and is, is also a really important project. So this is called Rural Studio, and it's a, a project that was started by a professor from Auburn State University named Samuel Mockby, and he would take a group of students <coughs> each year to Hale County, Alabama, and they would then work with local residents. It's one of the most impoverished counties in the country. Uh, work with local residents who had um, building needs, houses, community centers, all sorts of different things like that. And then the students would design and build, oftentimes using recycled materials and various um, materials that they could find to create these, these um, both domestic and public spaces. So now, and they've continued to do this over a series of years. It's been probably 15 or getting close to 20 years of doing this. So H Hale County is now um, has a whole variety of these different architectural projects that have happened there. Project Row Houses is in Houston, Texas, and was started by Rick Lowe, who is an art a, a fairly traditional artist when he started this project, doing paintings of a sort of political nature, but then um, started doing a much more sort of direct action kind of project that I think relates uh, to social practice, but once again wasn't called that at the time. So he found this set of row houses that were going to be demolished, and he got the city and the, and the developer who owned them to give them to him for a really low cost. And then he, he worked with a variety of different people to refurbish them and then turned them into a mix of artist residency spaces and housing for low-income single mothers. And then over the years, has continued to expand from there and, do, and take over a larger and larger part of that neighborhood putting in community centers and um, more housing and um, classroom spaces and all sorts of different things and offers all sorts of social services, after school programs, classes of all sorts um, and, and has really sort of transformed this neighborhood through his community development project that, that continues on as well. Pi Ranch is a group that we just had up here speaking as part of our Monday night lecture series a couple of weeks ago and they also are not um, a group that identifies themselves as artists, but I think that there's a lot to learn from them um, and the way that they, they are functioning as an organization. So they're, they're an actual little farm that's um, right off of Highway 1 in California between San Francisco and Santa Cruz. But um, instead of just being a, a, a normal farm, normal, even a normal like CSA farm or farmer's market style farm, instead they're an educational farm <coughs> And they bring in high school students from that region, um, San Francisco and Palo Alto and other, other places. And the students come on a, on a s regular basis <coughs> and camp out and learn about farming there um, and l learn about all sort of all the aspects it takes to make, uh, eventually to make act pies. And so they, they grow wheat and um, and all, all sorts of berries and, and everything that you would need to, to make pies with. And the students learn all of this process and then eventually make pies. And the, the, um, I think using pies uh, as opposed to, say, just exclusively focusing on greens, which are also great, obviously, but um, is that it, it's a really enticing thing and, and fun thing to sort of bring this population in on on uh, learning about agriculture and, and ecology and food systems. <coughs> so in, in, in the end, they bake all of these pies in an outdoor brick oven. 
Okay, so I'm going to switch from those. Just a, That was just a sort of uh, smattering of different projects, not at all complete at all, of um, some, some projects related to social practice. And now I'll talk a little bit about my own work. So as was mentioned in the introduction, I did a, a farming program at UC Santa Cruz. This was after I got my Master of Fine Arts degree at California College of the Arts. So I had my MFA, my terminal degree in art, and then I decided that I wanted to go and study farming, which is something I'd been interested in really my whole life, but um, hadn't formally studied. And the program that I did it in, this is a shot from that program, is called the Apprenticeship in Ecological Horticulture and Sustainable Food Systems. It was started by Alan Chadwick in 1967 on the campus of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, this is Oren Martin, one of the um, farm managers who teaches the apprentices. There's 40 apprentices each year who, at the time that I was there, we all lived in tents on the, camp on the farm on the campus and then um, learned both large-scale gardening and small-scale farming, had a CSA program, had a farm stand, raised our, uh, created our own food, cooked for each other, and took classes, visited other farms, all sorts of different things under this apprenticeship model. And then after that, I worked on a, a variety of farms, um, in, primarily in Marin, and then a little bit here in Oregon as well, also doing woofing in New Zealand, which I did before I did this program. And then some of that, I think, affected what I do as an artist and affected at least my perception of what social practice is by kind of looking at localized systems, not only of production in the case of, of farming, but also distribution in the way that CSAs and farm stands and community gardens and those sorts of things work, and then applying those uh, methods to art, which is normally not the way that it works. Um, one, one of my, the early projects I did, and I only have this kind of horrible shot, um, was directly related to that in an art context. So this was um, from a project called Farm City that I did with another artist, John Rubin, at a place called Southern Exposure back in the late 90s. Um, and what, what we did is we set up a, a decentralized CSA. So we got five different families in the Mission District of San Francisco to each, ag each agree to grow one crop. Um, in their backyard or on their rooftop or window boxes. And then in the gallery space at Southern Exposure, we created a little greenhouse. This is a shot inside of there. And we grew greens and also had information about the five families that were participating in the project and information about the crops that they were growing. And then once they were ready to harvest, uh, we would go and collect the, um, the crops from each, each site and then redistribute them to all of the other sites so that everyone got a little share of everybody else's produce and you'd wind up with a variety of different produce and then we sent along a newsletter with that that gave information about the, the, the sh other share members' histories and, and information about the crops that they were growing and then had that, all that information in the gallery space as well. So since then, uh, the projects have been less specifically focused on agriculture, but I think are still affected by a lot of the things I learned in doing those kinds of projects. Um, this, this is a project that uh, specifically focuses on war, and in particular, the Vietnam War. Um, I, in 2005, I was invited to go to, to Vietnam as an artist in residence as part of a, a program that was happening there. And I was really interested in doing that because I realized that I didn't know very much about the Vietnam War, even though I was born during the time that it was going on, and it, it, it had such a major impact on the US, but I feel like most of my understanding at that time <coughs> was based on Hollywood film representation of it and not actually knowing the details or the history of what had gone on. So that seemed appealing to me to go there and be able to get firsthand um, knowledge from people who had experienced it. And then um, the other thing that was of interest was that in 2005, obviously the, uh, the war in Iraq and war in Afghanistan were going on. And it felt to me like that was also something that um, <clears throat> had in a way happened maybe because of a popular ignorance to the history of what had, what had taken place in Southeast Asia. And that had we had a better understanding of that, that maybe we would not have allowed that to happen. So, so I was interested in, in going there. And when, when I went there, started talking to people, um, they told me that if I was if I was interested in this subject, I should go to this museum in Ho Chi Minh City that's called the War Remnants Museum. So I went there, <coughs> and and this is a shot in their front courtyard where they have actual remnants from the war, like helicopters, jets, tanks, 
bombs. And then on the interior, there's a set of a, uh, in, the, in the main um, gallery of the museum, there's a set of about 100 photographs covering the, uh, the US involvement and aftermath in Vietnam. And so I'm going to show some of those images in a second, some, some of which are pretty gruesome. So feel free to uh, avert your eyes. I was definitely doing a lot of that when I first encountered these images myself. Um, and so the way that I've got this set up here is this is the photo which would be framed in the museum, and then this is the text that went along with it. So it's just, I've composited these two together. Um, so you, this is the bottom of that photograph. S and it, it happened to be both in, in Vietnamese and in English because English is the common language in, in Asia, not so much for American tourists being there. But uh, it included images like this of of what amounted to sort of waterboarding, which had become a, a big issue that it was coming up again because of uh, torture-related activity in relationship to the Middle East, uh, the, the wars in the Middle East. So it was, it was sort of bringing me in touch with a history that I kind of didn't want to have to think about, but I was glad that I was having to think about it. Other images like this that are just sort of the horrors of war that always happen. <clears throat> An interesting thing that they did was that a lot of the photographs in the museum were bootlegged photographs from US magazines, so that, and they would just acknowledge that. So they would re-photograph an image from a magazine, blow it up, frame it, and then you know, put it in the museum. And they even you know, identified it as coming from Life magazine. And there were a lot of bootlegs that I was running across in Vietnam, so that was something I was, I was thinking about will, and will relate to what I eventually did. So here's another one. This is photos from the My Lai Massacre. They were also in Life magazine. And then um, images that were taken by Vietnamese documentary photographers of the environmental devastation that happened as a result of um, herbicides and defoliants like Agent Orange. And then the effect that that had on the, um, on the population, so that there were lots, lots and lots of birth defects which continued to, be, uh, to, continue to occur in Vietnam and, and are very evident on the streets of Ho Chi Minh City and other, all across Vietnam. They ended in, the, in that section with a, just a set of stats on the war. And I think often uh, or many people in the United States are familiar with the number of US troops killed during, during that 10-year period. Um, anybody know that number? That's the number of names on the Vietnam War Memorial Wall in Washington, DC. Yes? What's you say? Uh, good guess, 58,000. 58,000, um, which you know seems like a huge number, and it's it's you know a lot more than have been killed in the current wars, um, but um, in Vietnam there were nearly three million people killed, so that's a number that people are much less familiar with, and that doesn't take into effect what happened afterwards and how that affected Cambodia, Laos, all of that. You start getting up into you know many many millions of people killed as a result of this this uh, military action. It also includes number four, uh, injured and affected by chemicals, et cetera. And then they have this line on how many old people get lonesome as their children or relatives were killed during the war, which normally doesn't get mentioned, but is obviously always a, a result of, of a war. So I was really affected by this and did, went back several times to view the museum. And then I had this idea that it, it would probably be, be a good idea for more people in the US to familiarize themselves with this perspective on the Vietnam War, especially at this time. And so what I did is I took a cue from, from the museum itself in doing the bootlegging that they had done to create some of their images, and I just re-photographed everything in the museum, um, which these images that I'm showing you are some of those. And then I, I, and I just took them with a, a digital camera that I had with me, a small digital camera. Then I went back to the US and did an, a residency that had been lined up in advance um, at uh, Art Pace in, Houston, in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I spent two months working with a printer there, printing all of these images, and then I recreated the museum in, in San Antonio. Um, but as I was doing that, I was also doing more research myself in the San Antonio Library, both through books on the Vietnam War, and films, and all sorts of things. And then I was also organizing public events in which local people from the San Antonio area could come and talk about their, their experiences with the Vietnam War. This was a man who had been a Marine during the war and had gone there and, and talked about his experiences. There were also aid workers and protesters and, and immigrants who had come from Vietnam. And then we also had uh, discussion groups to talk about the, the war and its implications. And I had f uh, free film screenings of documentary films, this one's Hearts and Minds, from uh, the San Antonio Public Library. 
And then the recreation happened in the, some of the galleries at Art Pace. This is just one room. There were two rooms that took, took up uh, the, the project. And all of the images were just sort of lined up chronologically on the shelf so that people could, through the photographs, experience kind of what I had experienced by seeing the museum in Vietnam. Then that show traveled to about eight other locations around the United States. So this is when it went to the uh, University, or Virginia Commonwealth University in, in um, Richmond, Virginia. And in each location, I had public events in which local people could uh, talk about their experiences with the war. And oftentimes, uh, really interesting things would happen. Um, this was a vet who had never talked about his experience in the war, and he brought photographs of himself and, and his uh, experience there, and he'd never talked about it before, and so that was a really sort of moving experience for him. Then it went to um, uh, White Columns in New York City and a public event there, and then a smaller scale version of it also went to the, uh, the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, and the public event that happened there was with MIT faculty, including Noam Chomsky. Then in Los Angeles, um, they had a billboard space that they asked me to also do, do something for. So I just went to the public library in Los Angeles, pulled out a lot, of, a lot of the books that I'd been researching, photographed their spines, and then had that printed as a billboard to kind of indicate to people that there was all of this information out there if they wanted to do more of their own research on it. And then there was a public event there, too, with local people talking about their experiences with the war. So then another project that I did uh, started here in Portland when I ran across this man, Michael Patterson Carver, selling drawings <coughs> in front of the Trader Joe's in northwest Portland. I took a glance at them, not really expecting to be super interested in what the drawings were, but then when I looked at them, I, I was really interested. They were all drawings of protests. And he had, he had both current day ones that he had participated in himself, this was still during the Bush administration, and then historical ones that he'd done research at uh, the public library and found images from. So a huge number of them. And he just turned out to be a really interesting person also. So I started talking to him and then uh, bought one of the drawings which he was selling and then asked him if he would like to show the work in a gallery space. I thought it was great that he was showing them on the street and having dialogue with people there, but I thought maybe he'd also like to, to show them in a different context. And in this case, it's sort of a reversal of things. Rather than sort of taking something and putting it into a public space um, that's outside of an art world um, venue, I was, sort of, I was putting it, something that was from the outside into an art world venue. So it, it goes, these things sort of go back and forth, especially I mean, with it, within my work, that's a lot of what I've done is sort of trying to break down these, the walls in between those things. So um, he said he'd like to do that. I contacted a curator I had worked with on the American War, uh, Matthew Higgs at White Columns in New York. He said that he would like to show the work. And so I ended up um, getting money from uh, White Columns to purchase 10 of Michael's drawings. Those were then sent to New York, framed and shown in an exhibition. And then they sold those and sent him the additional money that they made after, the, after uh, taking out their costs. And, um, and then it wanted more, more uh, drawings to show and sell at art fairs. I connected him to another gallery here locally. He started making enough money that he, at the time that I met him, he was living in a tent in Forest Park. And he moved into a motel room, but then was sort of burning through his money. And we, eventually he saved up enough that I was able to help him um, rent a, uh, an apartment. This is actually from a historical photograph during Prohibition, so it's uh, not, a, not a joke. So this is him signing his lease papers when he, when he got his apartment in North Portland. He had to put six months down in cash because he had no credit history, so I had to help him with that. This was his space that he got, and then he was able to do more elaborate drawings and paintings <coughs> and not worry that they were gonna get rained on while he was in his tent. And so he started doing these larger scale ones like this. And then I, no I nominated him for an, a, an award at the New Museum in New York City called the Altoids Award. And, I, and, and the way that that worked was that they had asked 10 artists from across the country to each select five regional artists from their region to, to nominate for this award. And then there were three jurors in New York, uh, Paul McCarthy, Cindy Sherman, and Rick Retervenicia, who selected four of those, from those 50 um, artists to win this award, and Michael was selected as one of them. So he got $25,000 and a show at the New Museum in New York. 
This was an image uh, from a strike that Emma Goldman had put on in the neighborhood where the new museum is now in, in New York City, and it was shown as part of the exhibition at the new museum. So this is him at his opening. He actually flew me out to be with him at the, the opening in New York uh, with him. This is him standing next to some of the artists and curators that were part of the exhibition. And this is him celebrating on the New Museum's terrace. He's continued to show and has now had solo shows in Paris, Brussels, London, New York, and, um, and, and sells his work and travels all over the country. He doesn't live here in Portland anymore. And not too long ago, I, I worked with a publisher in London, and we published a book of his work also that's called Free Speech Then. So then, and then a lot of the work that I've, I've done has been about looking at very sort of site-specific um, conditions and the dynamics. So this was, this was a, a really sort of simple project, but I think is um, a good example of a lot of the work that I do that happened in the Yukon. And what I did was I just asked local people who lived in this very small town, Dawson City, to give me a tour of that area and, th and for each of them to take a turn talking about something of significance in the, in the area. And so as we went on this tour, in which I was sort of learning about it, about this place, also all of the people who were participating were learning from each other. And so that's something that I'm really interested in, is kind of setting up participatory uh, learning experiences that, that benefit me, but also benefit the participants. This was the, the final stop on this, on this tour, in which a salmon fisherman talked about the conditions of, of being a salmon fisherman in, in the Yukon, which was heavily affected by the fishing that went on in Alaska. And then he, he um, grilled up some salmon and served it to the participants as well. And this is a kind of variation on that that was done at the, in, in Indianapolis and was sponsored by an art center there, as, as was the Yukon project. But it happened in an international grocery store in, in uh, Indianapolis called Saraga. And w the thing I was interested about this place when I saw it was that the aisles were designated by geographical location. And, and so you know, there would be the Indian food section or the Japanese and Korean. And that it seemed like also the people who were shopping in those, those aisles were oftentimes from those places. And so I kind of attempted to harness the knowledge that existed in that place and worked with local art students who then uh, made collaborative projects with customers from the, the, um, the grocery store. And they created these, these poster displays um, in which those customers got to talk about their home country and then on a, and, and had those lined up in front of the aisles where those, those geographical areas were identified and the foods were there from those places. And then those, on, on one day, we had a series of presentations in which those people, who had normally been customers of the store, became kind of lecturers at the store. So here's this woman from Venezuela talking about Venezuela in, the, in that aisle, that area, to a group of people who had both come specifically to see this event and then also customers at the grocery store, because it was going on during business hours. So it was kind of using a public space but adding another dimension to it, sort of turning it into an educational experience in, in what was otherwise a, a kind of retail space. Then this is a project that probably most of you are familiar with that was um, done last year. <coughs> and this is the side of the, a wall on the Fifth Avenue here, um, just down the street. And so I was commissioned to do a public art project for that. <coughs> and what I decided to do was um, ask everyone at Portland State through an email if they would uh, select a book that they used in their own research or study or teaching um, that was available in the PSU library. And then I worked with uh, one of the PSU social practice students, Avalon Kalin. We went and pulled out all of those books and then photographed a selection of them using kind of the model I had done for the billboard in Los Angeles and then created uh, this, this piece that just sort of shows a variety of, of books and subjects that are taught and talked about here at PSU. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the student projects, just uh, primarily three different projects that um, are happening through the MFA and Art and Social Practice program here, which isn't specifically set up to, to address sustainability, but sustainability becomes a factor in it um, for some of the students. Um, one, one feature of the program is that we do a lot of field trips and experiential learning. This is a, a shot from a field trip we went on to Savi Island 
talked to someone who lived in a houseboat there about his experience in that environment. But um, yeah, so now I'm, gonna, I'm just going to talk about these three three different people and projects. Um, one of which was a uh, ISS uh, solutions generator uh, award uh, receiver. That's um, Nolan Kalish's project. Who he runs a, a, a CSA farm just outside of the city called Wealth Underground Farm. So this was his proposal for the um, the solutions generator, which ultimately was to build a classroom. Uh, to, to use at his farm, and this is model of that, which he worked on with Molly Sherman, who, and maybe Molly can hop up here and help me explain some of this. So they then um, created this classroom, and then the two of them also started a project called uh, Farm School. Do you want to talk about that? So this is Molly Sherman. So um, the outdoor classroom became the home base for our project called Farm School. Um, and Farm School brings together art, agriculture, and education um, through site-specific learning. And we do classes both on the farm in this classroom, but also um, other places as well. But the commonality between them is knowing your place and rooting yourself in the place. Um, so this summer we had a six-week course. This is a photograph from it. Um, where we learn the history of the classroom site, going all the way back to um, when it was originally homesteaded um, in 1916. Um, and then we'll be teaching a course through Chiron um, this winter here at PSU. And we also had, this is an image from this summer, we had an exhibition of all the research we did. And that's how it culminated. Thanks. So Nolan is also, um, interested in, in, in initiating greater sort of connection between Portland State and, and his farm. And we're in the process of, of trying to develop further ideas related to that and how we can connect students and classes from a diverse set of um, disciplines in, and find connections at this, this local farm that's only 10 miles away. Okay, so here's, a, here's another uh, project done by one of the social practice MFA students, Travis Souza who lives in Scotland, so he's not able to be here tonight to help present this. But I, I worked with him on this project a bit, so I know it pretty well. His proposal, <coughs> or the, the project that he decided to do, it, which is called We Make the Road by Walking, uh, was to walk from Los Angeles down here um, along the proposed high-speed rail line, this is that, to San Francisco. Um, this is a proposed high-speed rail line that hasn't been installed yet, but is in the works and funding is, is being um, sought for it. They have some funding, both state from the state and, and federal government, and they're looking for additional funding to put it in. And, th and this would be a high-speed rail like the type of high-speed rail that exists in Europe and Japan, and that doesn't exist here in the U.S. at this point. And, and seems like, in many ways, a great idea um, for a variety of reasons. But Travis is from the Central Valley, in this area, uh, that's where he grew up, <coughs> and his family, st some of his family still lives there, and he knew from having contact with them that a lot of the farmers in the Central Valley were really concerned about the high-speed rail line because it was, the proposed line was going to cut through many of their farms and would, would have um, a big impact on the way that they were able to continue to farm those, those spots. And so because of, of his sort of mixed feelings about the, um, the high-speed rail, he decided to do an experiential project that would also, that would educate him and bring more awareness to the, the issues surrounding this project by walking the, the line from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And so he, he went with uh, two of his brothers and then various other people who came along at different points and walked the line starting at Union Station in Los Angeles where the train would, uh, would start there and then through the Central Valley all along making uh, documentary videos about the people and, and places that he was uh, encountering and you know learning more and more about that there was various press coverage that happened as well and this it took about five weeks to get from Los Angeles to San Francisco camping out along the way this was at the International Chavez Center which is was uh, Cesar Chavez's foundation for um, addressing uh, farm worker issues and where he lived, Cesar Chavez lived, and 
and I actually met up with Travis and his brothers there, and we got to learn about the history of that place um, from the people who were still there, who were, who were um, fellow workers uh, with Cesar Chavez on those projects and continued to do that work there. So we were encountering interesting historical things along, along the way as well, and those were being recorded as part of these documentary videos that were being made and put on the web. This is a, a supervisor from Fresno who had, a, a, who was strongly in favor of the, the high-speed rail line. So he met a lot of both um, proponents and opponents to the um, to that project. This was at a uh, ecological site, also in, near in Los Banos in the Central Valley, in which some of the social practice students from here came down and met with the Sousas to um, to walk a section of the line and learn about the issues going on there. This was with a group of farmers who were, who were opposed to the high-speed rail and learning from them as well. So what he did with, through this project was to create a really comprehensive educational experience for himself and for others that looked at all s sorts of different sides and didn't necessarily have um, a solution, but was able to delve into the, to the issue and, and allow people to have a much fuller, complex understanding of, of what was going on with it through this process. And we had a lot of fun doing it as well. And in the end, the, uh, Travis and his brothers did a final presentation in San Francisco um, and invited various people who they'd met along the walk to present with them. And then the, uh, the project is now going to probably go back to the Central Valley and be presented to those people there, the findings that happened as a result of this. OK, and then uh, Catherine Ball is another graduate student in the program who's done several projects related to sustainability. So I'm going to have her talk about those quickly as we start to wrap up. So here's Catherine. So this is a map from a bicycle trip that I took across the United States. If I sound a little funny, I just was at the dentist. <laughs> uh, so I started, last August I started in Portland, Oregon, and I bicycled along the northern tier to Washington, D.C interviewing people along the way about uh, the solutions they were working on to climate change in their communities. And in D this is a picture in Detroit, uh, for example. It's at uh, one of the few public schools in the country for pregnant teens and preteens. And they have a farm uh, program there because formaldehyde, uh, which is used for, you know, for preserving uh, frogs and things like that for dissection in science classes, is really harmful to pregnant women. So I started this farm as an educational portion for, to cover the science class requirement. And this is just a photo from, uh, from biking around in North Dakota. Um, so the trip ended at in DC, and we took these different solutions that um, we had come across and then talked to legislative aides. This is Dennis Kucinich. Um, we talked to about 30 different legislative aides as well as uh, representatives. And then we went down to um, Cancun for the United Nations Climate Change Conference. Uh, where I was a delegate there, as well as I lived in the jungle um, as part of the People's Climate Summit that happens in tandem with that. Is so, that uh, yeah, but this one's in connection with the island one. Where's that in relationship to yeah, this? right after that. Okay, great. So um, this was a public event that I organized as part of a project um, that was, I was an artist in residence at the Indianapolis Museum of Art this summer, um, which uh, what I did was I lived in this small, floating island in the middle of the lake. There's an art nature park. Uh, the island was designed by Andrew Zattel. This is from, uh, I curated a series of five public events um, during my residency. The whole residency was about water. So there were public events about water, and then I was also experimenting with using mushrooms to take the E. coli as well as pollution out of the water. Do you want to just quickly talk about Public Social University and where you got that idea? Sure. The, public, the idea for Public Social University was actually from two undergraduate or they, I guess they've recently graduated, two students here, uh, Rosal Medina and Judith Fleming, and they curated a bunch of public social universities that were hosted at the art space I used to run called Sea Change. And the way public social universities work is they're free schools, um, but each time they have a different theme. So they had w done one at, at the space that I ran that was on water, and then when I was in Indianapolis, I was like, oh, I should just do a public social university on water. And the way that it works is they would always just go out in their community and find people that had interesting takes on whatever theme. Um, so Oops, I got that wrong. that's okay. Okay, great. Um, 
So I like like in Indianapolis, I had a comedian give a speech about water. There was another woman who had done a bunch of research on uh, issues of with how water privatization was affecting women in 1990s in Britain. Um, so that was like one component of it. Uh, this is an aerial view of the lake where I was living. Um, you can see in the upper right-hand corner, there's a small dot in the lake. That's the island that I was living on. And then that circle is where I placed a bunch of things called mycobooms, which we'll probably get to in a few slides. Um, and they were filtration devices. It was uh, long burlap sacks that were filled with straw that was inoculated with mushroom spawn. This is a picture of the igloo that was designed by Andrew Zattel. Uh, this is a gray water system that I built inside of the island. Um, and the way that this works is there's a sink at the, on the top of the counter. The water goes down into these two mushroom beds. Uh, those, that's the one with the cardboard in them. And then it filters on over into the plants. Um, and then the plants just transpire the water into the air. So I didn't have to deal with any effluent because it was a really big pain in the butt to move things back and forth with the rowboat. And that was the most successful thing I had done, uh, did there. This, this was uh, my proposal that I gave to them about using these mycobooms. So I attached them to the island as well as um, in that inflow outflow stream. And the reason that the lake was so polluted was that um, the stream that oxbows around the lake, um, the city, when there's as little as a quarter inch of, of rain, the city flushes the sewage into the river. And that inflow outflow stream would kick it back into the river. And there were also lots of issues with illegal dumping that had occurred in this lake. Um, so I was following the research of mycologist Paul Stamitz, who lives near Olympia, Washington. And he has developed this concept called the mycoboom, which again is these burlap sacks you can see here that have straw inside of them that are inoculated with oyster mushroom spawn. And that's a picture of the oyster mushrooms growing out of some of the mycobooms. Um, and it's not actually the mushrooms that filter the water. It's, see the white stuff on the side of the burlap? That's the mycelium, which is the vegetative part of fungi. The mushrooms are the fruiting body of fungi. So if you thought of, mush if you thought of fungi to be like an apple tree, the mushrooms would be the fruit, and the mycelium would be the tree and the roots. And then that's a picture from the gray water system, which is a really good indication that the gray water system was really working really well because there are tons of mushrooms and it's really happy. Uh, so this is what I've been doing most recently. I spent uh, three weeks camping at Occupy Portland and I've been involved with helping organize the, some of the demonstrations and activities around uh, Around the, around the occupation. So this is a picture of the bike swarm, which is something that I helped organize collaboratively with an affinity group. Um, what happened was during the eviction, someone came up with the great idea that we should have a bicycle ride going continuously around the march to prevent the police um, from taking over from taking, from taking the park. Um, so we had a group of about 100 bicyclists that bicycled around around the camp. And then it was so, it was successful in a, in a lot of ways, but one of, the reason, one of the ways it was successful is people got really energized by it. So this is a picture from the N17, the Occupy the Banks Day of Civil Disobedience. Um, and so this is uh, the swarm again. Uh, we came and did a bunch of diversions and helped protect the march and things like that. Uh, and then I also am really interested in how I can apply my, my skills as a visual artist into this movement. So this is an image of the flags that was for N17, Occupy the Banks, Day of Civil Disobedience. Um, and then these flags were also hung at Occupy Portland, um, as well as a standoff that we had with the cops after the eviction. And all of the things that you just recently saw were all done in collaboration with various people throughout Portland. And that's been an amazing thing that I've learned recently is, uh, is the importance of collaboration and that I'm able to like do so much more, like have such a greater impact if I'm working um, in collaboration with people. Great, thanks. Um, and so then this, this uh, last image for, that I'm gonna show is just a, an image that was taken a couple weeks ago um, as part of a class that I'm teaching that's called Art, uh, Society, and Sustainability. And these are the students in the class, uh, two of whom had, had uh, made a, um, a, a, had attempted to lay out all of the sustainability-related groups at Portland State and to make, uh, try to figure out how they're connected. 
And because this was such a confusing thing to even all of us in the room who, who were pretty familiar with these, these things and still didn't know all of, all of uh, these connections in all of these groups, we decided that we should organize a, an event and invite as many of those organizations as possible. And so that's going to be happening on December 2nd uh, at the Fieldwork space from 4 to 7 p.m. in which all, as many groups from Portland State that we've been able to contact who have something to do with sustainability, I think we're up to about 25 or 30 at this point, will come and present briefly on what it is that they do and, and start to make uh, hopefully deeper connections and collaborations to work together and become more efficient um, in doing the, the, the work that they want to do here at Portland State. Okay, and so that's the end of the presentation with Jason. You'll get the lights, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And once again, this is this is a pretty quick overview, just sort of touching on a, on a variety of of history, current my own my own practice, and what's happening in the program. There's lots and lots of other examples and divergent ways that these things can work as well. Any questions? Oh. Uh, Come up to that mic if you have a question. Somebody's got a question. Sarah, you've always got a question. Come on. I knew it. Um, can you announce that event that's coming up for the sustainability to let it through? Oh, we'll send out an announcement. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So de de December second, field work, four to seven p.m. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Yes, sir. Um, I guess I'm interested in your kind of further thoughts about the delineation between social practice and social change work. Um, I kind of, I, this has been very, very interesting, and I come at this as kind of an activist that does a lot of social change work, and I just, I think that's a really, for me, fascinating question. Like, how do you delineate those two, and, or is there no delineation, and how do we understand social practice as separate from social change, or perhaps it's not? Well, I, I think it probably is. Um, in, in the same way that um, within social practice, there are people and activity projects that focus on a variety of different things. And so for some people, what they're interested in is agriculture. Some people are interested in sports. Some people are interested in activism. Some people are interested in you know, alternative education. And, and it can also be like you know, totally site-specific and situational. So a lot of the work that I do, um, even though I see it as part of what could be called social sustainability, the focus of a given project may have to do with somebody who owns a rug store in a particular neighborhood and sort of doing work with that person so that they feel sort of valued and that their history is, is looked at. Uh, um, as as part of my own interest in in um, in valuing non celebrity type people, I feel like in the in, in the media there's there's too much um, focus on on you know a small set of people. It's kind of a, the equivalent to the one percent or something like that. There's like one percent of people who get any sort of like media coverage generally, and I'm I'm really interested in shifting that up and and using my own agency to to um, learn about and present uh, the lives and and work and histories of all sorts of different kinds of people. I don't know. I mean that that could be thought of as part of social change, but it's not um, explicitly done in that way as like its agenda. I think that an interesting way of thinking about this too is that there's a, there's a, a book that's pretty important, has become kind of important at least to, to our, our social practice program that's called We Make the Road by Walking, which is what Travis Souza named his project after also. And it's, it's a book that was done by um, Miles Horton who was an educator in um, Tennessee who started the Highlander Institute, and uh, Paulo Freire, a Brazilian uh, educator. And they just got together and had a conversation. The conversation was recorded and transcribed and turned into this book, We Make the Road by Walking. At some point, Miles Horton is talking about the difference between what, what he was calling organi organizing, and you could sort of see that as, a, as like activism. He was sort of talking about like union organizing, which he'd had experience with, um, and then education. 
And so you could you could look at that as like the difference between um, activism and and social practice art or something like that. And the, what what he was saying the difference was is that within organizing or I think also within activism, um, the 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 main value is placed on achieving a goal. Um, th this is a simplification possibly, but like maybe maybe a kind of useful one. So if what you're what you're trying to do is stop a, a war or shut down a coal uh, factory or whatever it happens to be, like that, that's your objective. And you sort of do what you need to do to do that. And once it's done, you're done. You move on to your next objective. Within education or maybe within social practice, the, you don't have uh, a single sort of objective. And instead, you're able to go off on all sorts of tangents because really your, your, your objective, if you have one, isn't to, um, isn't to uh, achieve a, a specific um, goal like like that, uh, like like ending a, a war or a, a, a um, power plant, but instead trying to have an, an experience and like an, a potentially an educational experience or a social experience that can that could affect all of those things, but not necessarily so directly. So that so that and he was saying this. Miles Horton was saying this that. As an educator, he can like drift off into all kinds of different things and sort of lose sight of this this single single sort of goal, and that's still okay. In fact, that's what he's sort of valuing. Whereas if you were if you're you were, you were like a striking um, union organizer, then the strike and achieving those those goals is all you're really concerned about, and you'll do whatever it takes to get that to happen. It's I don't know if that helps clarify it, but that's sort of something that I think about is that I'm, I'm kind of more interested in, in, these, in these broader general things rather than the sp specific acute ones that I think would fall more under the idea of social change or activism. And those, those things can be a part of social practice, but I don't think social practice is, is always those things, just like it's not, not always agriculture or, or anything else. It, it's, it's very, very mutable. Any other question? Yeah, so I it's got another one. Actually, yeah. response to, to that oh, question, okay. and it's the other end of that right. not, that line, and that is the art, the the realm of the object based, um, where object based art practices, and where's your, your where do you bump up against that? And could you talk a little bit about about social practices, rel the relationship social practice has to object based work? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so this this is kind of a more of a, like an art question, but um, like I was describing at the, the beginning of the lecture when I was showing the studio and, the, and a museum and, the, and a normal concept of the way that an artist works is that the artist goes into a, a, this rarefied space, a studio, makes discrete objects like paintings or sculptures. Those get transported to a gallery kind of space. Typically that's first stop. If they, get, if they go anywhere, they go to a commercial gallery or something kind of quasi-commercial gallery. And then if, if they get sold to a collector or a museum, then they move into that realm. And so that's the primary way that a, what I call a studio gallery paradigm functions, is, is it's the, the emphasis is placed on these objects that are turned into commodity objects. And everything else is sort of radiating out from that. And there's trends and fashion and various um, you know, academicness. Most, most academic art programs are set up around this idea of that that's what artists do, is that they make objects for sale. <clears throat> and so with social practice, it's not that we're opposed to object making at all. It's just that the objects within social practice projects are, um, are designed to function as, as like to, to have a utility within a larger project that has some other goal in mind besides a commercial one. And so the, the commercial aspects are are de-emphasized drastically within social practice. It's not that they still fit within an economy. You still need to be funded in some way or another, but you're you're almost for sure not going to be funded by a commercial gallery or a commer the commercial system. And so that's where it changes. It's just sort of de-emphasizing that. And once you de-emphasize that, which is such a huge part of the traditional art world, then all sorts of other possibilities emerge. But you still might make an object, and I have made many objects as a result of projects I've done, everything from bronze sculptures to, to photographs and paintings and videos and all sorts of things. But they've always been at the service of a larger project with a diff, uh, some other conceptual 
um, framework besides a commercial system. Anything else? And then we'll maybe wrap up after one more. Aki, you got some? Are you, are you leaving or you have a question? Oh, okay, good. Emphasize the object-based artwork, and, 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 and especially at PSC, that it has become a program. What kind of sort of, um, I, I don't want to call it skill set because it sounds like, you know, still object making, but what, what kind of things do you emphasize in your program? Yeah. Um, what kind of abilities do you expect? And I noticed that it's also a graduate program. Do, do you ever see that becoming an undergraduate program? We have undergraduate oh. classes too, yeah. but, um, and this is a technical thing, but because uh, PSU's art department doesn't have majors, it's an entirely interdisciplinary program. I mean, there's, there's three parts to it. There's art history, there's graphic design, and then there's art practice. And so within art practice, everything exists from printmaking to um, photography and social practice, painting, all of the sculpture, all of those things are within the same realm. And so you could, as an undergraduate, basically focus on social practice, and some students have done that, quite uh, like Crystal Daxley, Ali Drozd are examples. Um, so it does exist within the undergraduate, and I, I think that there's more room for that to develop further, though. But um, yeah, so as far as this, this skill set thing, though, I mean, one, we have to, I think, it, it, we can look at it from various angles, and I think there is there is an answer to this. But let me let me sort of like unanswer it for a second first. And in looking at contemporary art, we know that part of what has become valid because of Duchamp and and so many other things that have come after that. Sorry for for those of you who are not interested in art here, but um, so if you have somebody like Marcel Duchamp who almost a hundred years ago introduced the idea of a ready-made where he wasn't actually making something. Instead, he was selecting it and then showing it like an art object. Um, you, you've sort of gotten, once you've sort of accepted that as a valid way of functioning, then you realize like, okay, artists don't have to have those traditional skills to, to function as artists. They can, of course, but they don't have to have them. And we have examples of people like Vito Acconci who has done, you know, has, has worked in a whole variety of different ways, some of which touch on sustainability too, but he started as a poet and then did performance and then does now sort of public projects. And he said that his main um, skill as an artist, now he doesn't even want to call himself an artist anymore, but he said his main skill as an artist was using the telephone book, you know, that he could like find the person to make the thing that he needed made because he knew how to use the telephone book. And that really he was just the person generating the ideas and, and making sure that they, were, they happened um, properly. So in, in some ways, I think that within social practice, some people do want to focus very specifically on certain subjects, and photography is actually a big one. This, this year we have three photographers in the program who are very skilled as photographers and know all of the technical stuff and can teach it and you know, do all of those sorts of things. But they're trying to figure out a way to apply those specific skills to a social practice methodology and, and kind of practice. So I think that you can both have those kinds of skills if you want them, and you can further develop them if you, if you want to. Um, I, I have a photography background myself, too, and so I have all of those kinds of knowledge and skill, but I use them now just to take iPhone photographs with. So, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it still is impacting things, but that's how it's like, that's how it's expressing itself. But you also don't have to, and that's why we, um, we don't require that people have an, an undergraduate degree in art when they come into the program. So they could be coming from something completely different and find their way into functioning within a, so within a social practice uh, practice that isn't artistically skilled, but is much more about having developed a sensibility. And that's the thing that I think is, is the most important part to develop, not really not only as, an, as a social practice type artist, but as an artist in general is that you don't really, even though the market wants you to be identified specifically with a certain kind of media and object, because it's useful, you know, like if you're selling commodities, you want to have the same kind of commodity available, you know, un, in, in, in an unlimited way. But for an artist, it's not really useful to be stuck doing just one kind of thing. Instead, I think most artists are really wanting to function as interdisciplinary kinds of artists, but the, the constraints of the market and the art world sort of limit their ability to feel that they can do that. They usually have some outlet anyway that they don't tell their gallery about or something. But anyway, so, so what I, I think is important is to just develop your, your methods and your sensibility and to be able to um, 
land on your feet in any given situation and figure out what is interesting to you and to, and to, the, and to a public who, who would be there and how to invest those people in it, create a participatory uh, structure so that people feel connected. And that all of those things, although they're like difficult to test for and they're hard to, they're hard to teach because they're not as simple as you, you like, you know, set your aperture this way and you do, do that. I mean, we all know, I think, you, you as a photography teacher, and I, I've done that too, I mean, you can teach them all of those things and they can still take terrible photographs. Or you can not teach them any of those things and they can take an amazing photograph. So really, a lot of it has to do with, with um, your sensibility, your own, like, way of functioning within the world, like how you see things and how, how you present that to other people. And that can happen with a camera or with a canvas or with a, a social practice style project. Um, and that in, in some cases, you need to have technical skills, but you can do that more as like an on-demand way. So you could decide to learn those things for yourself on demand given a specific project, or you can work, collaborate with somebody or hire somebody to do those kinds of things with you instead. It may not be a satisfying answer, but that's what I've got for you. Any, 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 oh, Catherine's got one last question. We'll end it after that. Oh, I, they want you on the microphone for the, the online viewing public who could, who wants to know what you have to say. I know that most of your lecture has been about this, but I was wondering if you could speak specifically to artists' role within creating sustainability. Yes. Well, I, <coughs> as I, as I said, I think that, um, social practice, that sustainability is one aspect of that, so that some people are interested in. I mean, we could look at a broader view on, on that. I mean, we, we know from, from classes, like uh, Catherine's in, this, in the class that I'm teaching now, that we, if you attempt to talk about sustainability, it's kind of like talking about art. Like, pretty quickly, it's like ranging out in so many different ways, and there's so many contradictory views on it that's kind of hard to know what we're saying when we say sustainability. But my, my sense is that, in general, everyone has a responsibility to sustain not only their life, but the life of their community, their family, their, their, um, the rest of the population of the earth, the rest of the, the uh, <coughs> living beings on the earth, the earth itself. So, um, so, so I think that, 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 but that is the same for plumbers as it is for artists, as it is for professors, or whatever. We all have a responsibility to want to maintain and sustain all of those kinds of things. So, um, so I would hope that, that everyone would have that as part of their consciousness, but then I don't think that there's a direct mandate th that goes towards artists any more than any other profession to say that they are the ones responsible for doing this or that all of them have to address that. And I think that that would probably get, um, that, that, could, that could present some problems too. It could be interesting if we, if we somehow mandated that, but I'm not sure how we would do it. Okay. Well, I, I, I think that, you know, we, as, I, as, as we've shown, here are some examples, including the ones that you've presented, of the ways that artists can have a role in relationship to, to sustainability type issues. Um, I think they're unlimited, what those roles can be, and that it's to some extent still uncharted territory, and that the more sort of inroads we make to that, the more possibilities that future artists will continue to walk that path and continue to develop those kinds of things. So it's, uh, I don't think that there's, there's any, any specific way of answering that. It's just there's a whole bunch of different examples and there's a zillion future possibilities for that and that I'm sure you and, and others will be exploring that in the future. Okay, thanks a lot.